Uh, our next speaker is uh, Christopher Swift. He's a bit of an unusual fellow in that not only is he a political scientist, he's also an attorney. We'll forgive you for that. Uh, he received his JD from Georgetown University and his PhD from the University of uh, Cambridge. Uh, he has also an unusual way of doing research. He actually goes and interviews uh, militant Islamists in places like Afghanistan, Central Asia, and elsewhere. So he has undertaken a hazardous uh, career. And he is at work now on a book called The Fighting Vanguard, which is about uh, Al-Qaeda's relationship with insurgencies in various countries. Uh, he is a fellow of the Center for National Security Law at the University of Virginia. So I ask you to welcome Christopher Swift. Thank you, Alan. Appreciate that. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, everyone. I have the, um, the difficult task this afternoon of speaking to everyone, not only after lunch, when everyone's blood sugar levels are low, but also following my colleague and friend, Amin Tarzi, who I think gave an absolutely fabulous presentation on the dynamics in Iran now and how those dynamics are very quite different from how we perceive them from the West. I was coming up on the train this morning, and I was thinking to myself that when I was in high school, the best thing I could have hoped for would have been to have been a high school history teacher. And this morning I have the pleasure, and I've read through some of your biographies, of teaching high school history teachers. I mean, how much fun could that be? <laughs> and, and the teaching part of research, and the teaching part of policy, and I might add the teaching part of law, is something that's not well appreciated, it's not well understood. The most important thing I can do as a lawyer with a client is teach them how the law works and how the law affects their situation. The most important thing I can do as a policy analyst when I'm talking to the media or talking to the government is teach them how the conditions in a particular place at a particular time frame the decisions that we need to make, not just within government but also as a society supporting a government. And the most important thing that you can do as teachers of history is teach people not how to be good workers, not how to be good taxpayers, not how to be good employees, but to be good citizens. Right? And what does good citizenship mean? It means thinking critically. It means drawing distinctions. It means arguing with nuance and sensitivity. Now, what better topics for that kind of pedagogical exercise than the Arab Spring generally and the situation that's happening in Yemen one of the hotspots in the Arab Spring right now. And this is important because so many of the ways that we perceive what is happening in the Middle East, in Egypt, in Bahrain, and also in Yemen, have a lot to do with our perception of the global community or the regions that we're looking at. Right? But so much of what makes a country unique and so much of what affects the dynamics in a particular country is really local. It's fundamentally local. So while it may be informed by global ideologies and regional trends, which we'll discuss, those local parts are absolutely crucial. And this gets us into one of the things that I really like and really like to encourage teachers to do. Look at the local primary resources. Get the students into the stuff, not just that's on the front of the page, but that the local people in a particular region are reading. More importantly, get the students to come out of their perspective, sitting in New York or in Philadelphia or you know, down in Atlanta. I spoke with a woman from Atlanta earlier today or out in Chicago or even, I understand there's someone here from New Hampshire, from Proctor Academy. I'm from New Hampshire, hello. <laughs> um, get them to pull out of that space and put themselves in the space where these events are happening. Now, there are a bunch of different lenses that we can use to talk about the Arab Spring generally. This is Yemen right here. And it used to be that we'd talk about which Yemen, North Yemen or South Yemen, and we'll get to that. But the different lenses we can use to understand what's happening in the Middle East include dem the demographic lens. Let's see, that's not the right button, right? And generally speaking in the region, we've got economic stagnation. We have high unemployment. We have extremely high youth populations, which Amin mentioned regarding Iran. It's just as bad in some other areas. And we have rising commodity prices. Right? If you want to know whether the government in India, not part of the Middle East, but if you want to know whether the government in India is going to fall, look at the price of onions. The price of onions is too high. You can't cook Indian food. That means the majority of people are going to be dissatisfied with their current situation. Well, guess what? In Egypt, the price of tomatoes was a huge part of getting working people 
to mobilize against the government. It's what brought the, the political elite, the opposition elite together with the social classes, below, the social strata below them. So you've got to look at the commodity prices, you've got to look at economic stagnation, you've got to consider the, the, the consequences of a high youth population, especially if you've got young men in their early 20s who can't marry because there's no possibility of getting a job that would allow them to buy the house, which, oh, by the way, is the prerequisite for marrying the pretty girl down the street. Right? That kind of frustration boils over into some social and political mobilization that can be very constructive on the one hand, but also very destructive on the other, depending on how it's channeled. Looking beyond the demographic factors, you have to consider the political trends. And the general trend that we've seen in the Arab Spring has been the rejection, the rejection of secular Arab nationalist regimes and the rise of populist oppositions. Now, guess what? That populist opposition is sometimes Western looking and democratic. It may be Republican, you know, in, in parentheses. More often, than, more often than not, it's also Islamist. And Islamist is the same, is different from, we have to be very careful about this, Islamist is different from Islamic radicalism, right? Islamists are people who think, for better or for worse, that the solution to their society's ills can be found in religion. Some of those people aren't so different from uh, evangelical conservatives operating in this country. Some of those people aren't so different from the uh, Protestant political parties that formed in Germany after the Second World War. And some of them are absolutely nuts. So when you say Islamist, that's such a broad category that you, you really have to drill down and figure out, okay, who's Islamist, which kind, where do they come from, what do they believe, how do they interact with other groups that are like them in their particular society. These broad categories tell us nothing unless you're looking from the bottom up. And then the third lens that your students and we as critical thinking citizens can use to understand what's happening in terms of the Arab Spring is the strategic dimension. Right? And the critical trend that's happening, the phase shift that's happening in the strategic dimension, in the global war on terrorism, is this movement from fighting a global jihad on Islam's cultural and geographic periphery, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Somalia, back to the Arab core. Right? If you look at the, the war of the last decade was Afghanistan-Pakistan. That's where Al-Qaeda put its effort. That's where they went into exile in order to build their organization and make their mark on the world. Where is Al-Qaeda putting its effort now? Right here in Yemen. Where is Yemen? It's on the Arabian Peninsula. It is the heartland of Islam. And by capturing this space politically, socially, demographically, and ideologically, they see themselves transforming the world. Now, how do these three things play together? Well, in different countries, different factors inform what's happened in different ways. In Tunisia, we've seen not so much of a demographic problem, right? Yes, you had the economic dislocation, but you didn't have fundamental arguments over, you know, how the resource allocation and the rest. You had people opposed, generally, to a corrupt oligarchic regime. Well, the security component, no wars in Tunisia. They filmed Star Wars there. Just that's the only war they've had in a, in a while. <laughs> you might remember, you know, anyway. Um, now, in Egypt, the situation is very different, right? The political situation was important. But if you look at the, who was actually in the square, in Tahrir Square, if you look at who was actually mobilizing, if you look at who was able to convince the army that the regime had to go, it was the everyday working people. Right? It's the people who are, were government pensioners. It's the people who were you know, farmers and laborers. It's the people who were engineers who had six generations living in the same flat. Right? So huge concerns here about the future of the country demographically. Right? If you look at the young men who are on the streets, you, you cannot get married in Egypt until you can provide your spouse a fully furnished house. Right? Imagine a 22-year-old in America right now with this economy, providing his spouse a fully furnished house before being able to get married. Then go to a place like Egypt where the economy has been stagnant for 15 years. Right? Imagine the kind of social energy that that creates and how that pours out into the street. And why, as Jillian mentioned earlier today, people were willing to go into spaces that were unsecurable, like Tahrir Square, and become martyrs, witnesses, to use the actual word, to their own frustrations and their own socioeconomic dislocation, their lack of opportunity. 
So here you have a different relationship between the demographic and the political circumstances, right? But the security, it's a little bit more peripheral, but nobody's really fighting a war in Egypt right now. Yeah, they've had some you know, bad terrorist groups that have come out of there, but the last 10 or 15 years have been okay in terms of security in Egypt. Bahrain, totally different situation. In Bahrain, you have a Sunni majority, a Shia minority, right? The demographic and the political are very closely related because it's the, the Shia say, hey, look, we're half the population, more or less. We're, you know, the laboring class in the economy. What starts out as a labor dispute turns into a political dispute where the, the Bahraini Shia say, geez, we'd really like to have a prime minister. You can keep your king. We'll have a constitutional monarchy. We'll do something like the British have. It works really well for the British. And will balance our demographic and political concerns. Well, the security here gets pulled in. Why does security get pulled in? Because Iran intervenes, right? Iran intervenes with a particular segment within the Shia community, a minority segment. That gets the Saudis backs up. The Saudis intervene by virtue of the Gulf Coordination Council. And suddenly, something that starts out as a labor dispute turns into something that has a pretty clear security dimension. Libya. Not a whole lot of demographic concerns in Libya. Libya is the wealthiest country per capita in the Arab world. Right? Small population, population smaller than New York City, in an area bigger than Alaska. They've got a lot of, they've got a lot of oil. They do a really good job of exporting that oil. So development and opportunity in, economic opportunity in Libya is not so bad. The problem is the political situation there is run by a nutcase. Right? And when people start to resist that, right, when people start to resist the fact that they can't express themselves and they have no voice in the governing of their own society, it very quickly becomes a security problem as the country bifurcates along regional and tribal lines and heads into civil war. So in each of these instances, you have a different balance between the demographic concerns, the political concerns, and the security dimension, which is why it's vital to see each of these countries undergoing dramatic change in the Arab Spring from a local perspective rather than from a regional perspective and most especially from a Western perspective. So what about Yemen? Oh, Yemen didn't make it in there. Didn't Yemen make it in there? Yemen didn't make it in there. All right, we won't worry about Yemen. <laughs> so let's take a look at Yemen. Yemen, if you look at the security domain, if you look at the demographic domain, if you look at the political domain, is in a position of dysfunctional equilibrium. The place is inherently dysfunctional. It's dysfunctional because of demographic reasons, because of security reasons, and because of political reasons. And unlike every other area that's undergoing massive change, systemic change in the wider Muslim world, Yemen is the place where these things are pretty much the same size. They're all massive problems. And where they overlap with each other very, very closely. Let's talk about the demographics. The Yemeni population, core statistics, GDP per capita, under $3,000 under $3, per year, 34% unemployment. 34% unemployment. We have 9% unemployment in this country, and we have people camped out in the street here in Philadelphia. They have occupied the, the park across the street from my law office in Washington, DC. I've been living under occupation for the better part of a week now. I don't mind them. I wish they would shower more, but generally they're nice people. 45% of Yemenis, 45% live below the United Nations poverty line. Right? That's not our poverty line. That's not the British poverty line, the French poverty line. It's not the Saudi poverty line. It's the United Nations poverty line. Right? So that's a pretty low standard, and 45% of them are below it. 50% of Yemenis are illiterate. Not functionally illiterate, not, you know, they have some, they can't read, write. None, nothing. 60% of Yemenis, look at this number. Like, compare this with the number Amin was showing you for Iran. 60% of Yemenis are below age 25. That's in a country that's 73% rural, where there are 9.9 .9 million small arms, mostly Kalashnikovs, and only 24 million people. So 
Less than $3,000 per person per year, 34% unemployment, 45% below the UN poverty line, 50% illiterate, 60% below age 25, 73% of them live in a rural environment, 9.9 .9 million small arms, 24 million people. That's your demographic situation. Let's take a look at the economy. Negative trends everywhere. The positive trend is that they're growing at about 8% a year. In that economy, that's not enough to keep them even treading water. 6.6% 6 .6 of gross domestic product is spent on military and security services. In the United States, it's somewhere between 4 and 5% when we're really going gangbusters, right? Um, in most countries in Europe, it's sort of in the 2 to 3% range. So a very high percentage of what they're making is being put back into the military and security services. Annual inflation rate is 11%. Now, I was born in the late 1970s, and 11% would have been considered you know, a, re a reasonable interest rate uh, in, the, in the, a the ages of you know, 17 and 21 and 27% interest rate. But if you're paying 11% on a credit card right now in this country, and you're making, say, I don't know, say a high school history teacher makes $40,000 a year, that's still pretty serious. But if your money is losing 11% of its value every year, and you're making less than $3,000 a year, Oh, and by the way, you're illiterate, right? And you're under age 25. 36% the public debt in Yemen represents 36%, more than a third of their gross domestic product. Right? So one third, more than a third of every dollar that Yemen as a country makes, or every real that Yemen as a country makes, has to go to service the debt. So even if they could get ahead, they couldn't really get ahead, right? Because they've got this high military expenditure, right? They've got this ridiculous inflation rate. Never forget that the German government fell, the Weimar Republic fell in part, not because of ideology, but because of economics. And they've got this 36% public debt as a share of GDP. That makes, you know, lets us look pretty good. 50% reduction in Yemen's oil and gas reserves in just the last three years. Since 2008, 50%, half, of Yemen's oil and gas reserves, gone. Now that's a big deal for a Middle Eastern country, but for Yemen and the Yemeni government, 70% of Yemeni government revenue comes from the export of oil and gas. So in short, they're not just negative trends in terms of their economy, not just negative trends in terms of the population structure, they're circling the drain. Let's add to that the state of the Yemeni ecology. Yemen is beyond carrying capacity. 2.9% of the country is arable land. That means even if you, could get if you could get water to it, you could grow stuff there. The remaining what, uh, what is it, 97.1% of the country, is desert, mountains, and urban areas that have been urbanized since before Christ. Yemenis consume, or their per capita water consumption, the, the amount of water that's available, sorry, the amount of water that's available for Yemenis to consume on an annual basis is 220 cubic meters per person. In Saudi Arabia, sorry, in, in the Middle East generally, the annual consumption or the annual availability of fresh water is 1,250 cubic meters of water per person annually. The world average is 7,500 cubic meters of water per person annually. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to go to a place that has less fresh water to drink, you need to go to Tuvalu or one of the guano islands in the Pacific Ocean that has no water table to find a place that has less water, right? If for those of you familiar with Frank Herbert's Dune, this is Arrakis. Take out the sandworms and the Harkonnens and you've got Arrakis. There's no water. So what do they do with the fresh water that they have? 60% of the fresh water that's pulled out of aquifers in Yemen Right, falling water tables, lowest, one of the lowest levels of water, water availability anywhere in the world, 60% of that water is used to grow cut. Right, they estimate that somewhere between 25% of the labor 
in Yemen. All of the labor that's being done by all people, teachers, professors, doctors, lawyers, Indian chief, the whole nine yards, 25% of the labor in, in Yemen is being used to grow this stuff called cot. It represents 10% of their gross domestic product. And what do they do with it? They chew it and they get a buzz. It's a huge part of their social culture. Right? It's, huge. it's become a huge part of their culture. It didn't used to be. But over the space of the last 30 years, as their population has tripled since 1975 to the present, tripled, cat consumption's gone up. So where is their population going now? Well, they have one of the highest population growth rates in the, in the world, 3% annually. Right? That may not sound much for a country of only 24 million, but they're going to be around 48 million by 2035. Right? And they're already beyond carrying capacity in terms of what their country can do. Now, this wouldn't be a big deal if they could get some of those sexy detalinization plants that Jillian was talking about earlier, like they have in Dubai where they you know, put up a dome and everybody goes skiing indoors. They don't have the money to build a desalinization plant. Why? They don't have the money because 6.6% .6 of their GDP goes to the military, because they have an 11% annual inflation rate, because public debt as a share of GDP represents 36% of GDP, because their oil and gas reserves are dissipating rapidly, and because 70% of government revenue comes from oil and gas reserves. Right? Demographically, polit economically, ecologically, Yemen is the precipice of collapse. So, moving through these points, it shouldn't surprise us that the political situation there is going to be a little bit messed up. So first, a little bit of history. We are all historians here. I'm not going to go that much that far back, but until recently, until the early 1990s, Yemen was actually two countries. There was the Republic of Yemen in the north, which was, you know, uh, generally previously a monarchy and then became uh, an Arab Republic. And then you had this entity in the south called the People's Democratic Public Republic of Yemen. And those of you who remember the Cold War remember that any time the words People's Democratic Republic appear in front of the name of something, you know it's a Soviet satellite. And that's what it was. It was a socialist Soviet satellite. Say that five times fast. So in 1990, the United Nations, with a little help from the United States, a little help from Saudi Arabia, unify the two countries. Right? The Republic of Yemen and the People's Democratic Republic of Yemen come together in one country. You have a shared government. The North gets the presidency. The South gets the chair of the parliament. They have two militaries that don't really interface very well. They're both armed to the teeth. They're one sovereign, but they're still sort of facing off against one another. Why do they unify? Because the Soviet Union is collapsing and nobody is bringing home the bacon to Aden. Aden can't keep itself running. It needs, believe it or not, the North, because that's where the urban, that's where there was uh, an urban educated elite. And they also needed Saudi Arabia because they needed someone to help them exploit and export the oil and gas. So you have the situation that emerges in 1993, where you have a political crisis with these two groups that really can't see, see, see eye to eye ideologically. They can't agree on who should have what cabinet post. They can't agree on how to pass basic laws. The militaries are sort of you know, staring at one another. And by 1994, you have a complete breakdown. The South, the former communist South, secedes from the North. Nobody recognizes that secession, not even China, right? And they start shooting at each other. They start lobbing missiles at one another, right? They're shooting scuds back and forth at one another. Nasty, nasty little war lasts a few months. And that war puts two groups that we've seen in Middle East history, pits two groups that we've seen in Middle East history against one another. The first being the secular Arab nationalist, right? Your Iraq, your Egypt, your Yemen, your northern Yemen, versus your former socialist, right? Your former satellite, uh, Soviet satellite. And who do the Arab nationalists enlist in this particular struggle? They enlist the Afghan Arabs from Yemen who are just returning from Afghanistan in 1989 and 1990 as the Soviets withdraw. They also enlist, actually they don't actually enlist them, but bin Laden gets involved with this one because strangely enough these former socialists in the south get supported by Saudi Arabia. Right, so bin Laden sees Saudi Arabia helping 
a, a, you know, uh, apostate regime run by former communists that he was just fighting in Afghanistan in, in his native Yemen. And so he's, you know, at the time camped out in Sudan and he's running his training camp and all sorts of nasty people are coming through and going out. And he sends a bunch of people across the Red Sea on little boats to join the jihad supporting the North against the South. So what happens? Well, the South gets brutally beaten. And the successionists in the South are not only defeated, but they're basically put down. Uh, and this leads to lingering resentment and the, the institution or the movement in which that resentment from this 1993-1994 civil war is embodied is an entity called the Yemeni Socialist Party, which is the third largest political party in Yemen today and one of the very active uh, instigators in the current political protests. So what is this Arab nationalism that we're talking about? What's this secular Arab nationalism that seems to be under threat in places like Tunisia and places like Libya and places like Egypt and here in Yemen? Well, this is a President Saleh, also known as Little Saddam. Saleh, when he consolidates power, creates a secular Arab republic modeled on Nasser's Egypt. And then after Nasser comes out of the picture, right, he models it on Iraq. He models it on Saddam Hussein's Iraq. So not surprisingly, we have a single party. It's a Baathist type party. It's called the General People's Congress Party. And it dominates every institution in, of public life. Not surprisingly, that party is dominated by all the guys from Saleh's tribe. The Southern adversaries, the Yemeni Socialist Party, the people who used to be part of the Southern Successionist South, they wind up in a small parliamentary minority. They don't even have enough authority in the floor of parliament to order a ham sandwich. Not that they would because it's a Muslim country, but they couldn't, they couldn't order tea, right? They don't have any kind of, they're in the parliament, but they don't have any kind of power. And they're in a position where they have no incentive to be a loyal opposition. Because even if they were loyal, they wouldn't get anything. And then you have the Islamists, right? You have these chaps that signed up to defend the North against the South in the Civil War. You have these people who've come back from, you know, you, you have your do domestic Islamists of, of the Yemeni flavor, and then you have these people who've come back, these Afghan Arabs who've come back from Afghanistan and have a particular conception of the change that they can bring to their own societies and the change that those societies should bring to the wider Muslim world. And what happens to those guys? Well, they're accommodated, right? If they want to do something outside the country, that's fine. They want to go to Sudan and bomb some stuff or learn how to make bombs, that's fine. They want to hit, I don't know, a US destroyer in Aden, that's all right. But they're not going to have a, a seat at the table politically. They're not going to have a seat at the table politically. Why? Because Yemen is built on the secular Arab Republic model. Guys like Saleh don't see Islam as the way forward. They see it something that's holding them, their regime, and their extended oligarchic plutocratic family network down. Next slide. So not surprisingly, <laughs> after 20 years of this stuff, we see some political fragmentation. And that fragmentation existed before the Arab Spring and has been exacerbated and encouraged by the Arab Spring, especially by what's happening in Egypt. Because don't forget that the Yemenis are looking across the Red Sea to Egypt as a model for their society, not just in terms of what Saleh was doing with his regime in secular Arab nationalism, but it's also something that ordinary Yemenis have been doing for a long time. The Red Sea unites these cultures rather than dividing them. So who is the opposition? Well, the largest non-regime party in uh, Yemen is called Al-Islah. But that party really isn't a party. It's like the Democratic Party. It's a coalition of interests in a way. It's even more fragmented than the Democratic Party. I don't know if you know of Roy Rogers' comment, you know, I'm not a member of an organized party. I'm a Democrat. And moving on, um, different factions. You have Islamist factions, right, who are of your traditional Yemeni Islamist flavor. Then you have Salafists. You have these people who've become, you know, in most places in the Middle East, Salafists are quietist. They kind of dress the way they want to dress. They live in their own world. They think, pretend it's the seventh century. These Salafists in, in, uh, in Yemen are much more like the Salafists that appeared in uh, Fallujah and in other places in Iraq after the Saddam Hussein regime fell apart. They are militant, 
right? They're very radical, they're very militant, they're not quietists, they're not Salafists that pull themselves away from society and try to create their perfect utopia within their own community. They're people who want to change the community outside their own extended family networks and tribal networks. So you have run-of-the-mill Islamists, you have these new Salafist trends, you also have the Muslim Brotherhood, which is distinct from the Islamists and Salafists, right? In their political context, these guys are on a spectrum and those guys can be very far away from one another in terms of how they see things. Islamists think that Yemeni should ha Yemen should have a very traditional society. The Muslim Brotherhood in Yemen thinks, oh no, Islam is the way forward to a modern technocratic future, right? Yes, women will wear the veil. Yes, we'll have Sharia law, but really that's the way that we're going to industrialize and get good technology and improve the economy. We'll become a modern Islamic state, not a 7th century or 14th century Salafist state. And then you have the all-important tribal leaders, right? So al-Islah as a party exists in opposition, but it is itself an umbrella group. Now, al-Islah is a member of another umbrella group. We have factions within factions within factions. And that larger umbrella group is called the Joint Meetings Party. The name tells you everything you need to know. The Joint Meetings Party gets together to have wait for it, <laughs> joint meetings. <laughs> and who do they meet with? They meet with the other factions, including leftists, hardcore secular leftists like the Yemeni Socialist Party. And oh, by the way, if the Yemeni Socialist Party wasn't secular and leftist enough, you have three smaller parties that fall under the, the leftist penumbra, right, who are even more radical. I mean, they think Mao didn't go far enough in terms of secularism. Right? So already the opposition under this umbrella of the joint meetings group is pretty fragmented. Right? It's divided among the people who want to see a religious solution to Yemen's problems. It's divided among the people who see a leftist or a center left or a far left solution to Yemen's problems. And by the way, all of those people are working together under the auspices of the opposition. And then we have the third element. These are the opportunists. The opportunists basically fall into two categories, and this, this category has emerged sort of from 2009 into the present. So we saw the first inklings of it in 2008, but it's really much more of a, a, a contemporary development and not something that's structural. And these are the people who think that it's all going down. Right? They're like the folks I used to interview in Afghanistan who thought the whole thing was going to fall apart tomorrow. They should make as much money as they could today move the kids to Dubai, move the money to, to Switzerland, and then get out on an airplane as soon as the Taliban came back. Right? These folks think, OK, something's going to break, and I want to be in a position to win when it all comes tumbling down. And so we see tribal actors who, have absolute, who, who might really belong up here in this category aligning themselves in places like Aden and Abiyan with the Yemeni Socialist Party to provide the Yemeni Socialist Party with basically muscle, guns, people who know how to use guns, to back up so they're in a good position to benefit when the government comes apart. You also have army defectors who are breaking away. This is something that's been fascinating to see over the space of the last six months. Army units that are breaking away from the government because the government's been shelling their tribe. Right? And this goes to the fundamental truth about Yemeni society. The state is highly centralized on the secular Arab republic model, but Yemeni society is highly decentralized, right? State on the one side, society on the other, and in Yemen, since time immemorial, society has always dominated the state. So what does that mean for the third dimension of our analysis, right? We looked at the demographic situation, we looked at Yemen through that lens, we've now looked at Yemen through the political lens, the historical consequences and causes and consequences that have brought us to the current crisis, the current stability, the current situation. What about security? Well, this is what we hear the most about when we hear about news from Yemen, right? You hear about al you hear about Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, you hear about, you know, United Flight, uh, sorry, Northwest Flight 253. Well, it's even more complicated than that. There's three different trends affecting domestic and regional security in Yemen. The first trend being rebellion. And who are the rebels? The rebels are the Houthi rebels. And who are the Houthi rebels? The Houthi rebels are a Shia group, right? about a third of the population of Yemen, Yemen is Shia. But unlike the Shia you just heard about in Iran, who are called Twelver Shias, 
right, who believe they had 12 imams and the 12th imam will oculate and they'll come back with Jesus, white horse, you heard all about that, right? These are five or Shias, right? These guys were around as Shias when Islam split into Sunni and Shia camps. These are the direct descendant of the people that split away from the four, what the Sunnis call the four rightly guided caliphs and said, yeah, the fifth caliph is, the fifth caliph is gonna be this guy, right, who's a descendant of the prophet direct descendant of the prophet. We're gonna go with this guy instead. And then the, the, the Twelvers took that and they took it through seven more guys, basically, before they consolidated their theology. But Fivers are Shia, they're Arab, they're not Persian. And if you look at what they do on a day-to-day -day basis, they're really not that different from Sunnis. They just don't respect Sunni authority, they don't respect Sunni institutions, they have their own way of doing something, right? So this group has basically said, Sana'a, the capital of Yemen, you guys have been repressing us. We have no cultural self-determination. We're not able to do all the things we normally do. We're going to rise up against you. We have an insurrection. And so they've had four rebellions and four truces between the, the Houthi rebels and Sana'a, Saleh's government and Sana'a, since 2004. Right, this is like Kermit Kane and the 999. This is the four rebellions, four truces since 2004. Now the problem is that the Houthi rebellion, when it's on, and it, you know, it's usually on on a seasonal basis, when it's too hot, they don't like to fight, when it gets cooler, they do a little more fighting. I mean, you, the Chechens do the same thing, the Afghans do the same thing when winter descends on the mountains in Afghanistan and Chechnya, everybody goes home, right? Because it's cold and it's hard to move around when the snow's up to here, right? Well, the, the Houthis do the same thing. When it's oh my God hot where they live, they stay home. They have some tea, they chew some cot, you know, and then when it cools down, they go out and they fight. Well, this creates a huge border security problem for Saudi Arabia because the Houthi population sits, these five or Shia sit on the border, northern border of Yemen and the southern border of Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia is very interested in Yemen taking care of its Shia problem, right? Because Saudi Arabia has its own Shia population. They really don't want to see them get rambunctious. So Saudi Arabia has intervened on, the ha on behalf of the Yemeni government. Well, who intervenes on behalf of the repressed Shia? Of course, Iran has attempted, and in some cases allegedly successfully intervened on behalf of the Houthi rebels. Um, it's hard to know whether that is people taking their external view of what's happening in the region and putting it onto a fundamentally local conflict or whether that's actually in fact happening. It's not at the level of a proxy war, but it is at the level of here's some money, here's some guns, and here's some rhetorical support. So that's the first security problem that you have in Yemen. Rebellion. What's the next one? <sighs> Those pesky southerners. They want to secede. Why? Because they used to be their own country. Why? Because they had a nasty civil war. Why? Because they've been systematically repressed, depressed, suppressed, and oppressed since that war got over. So you have this socialist resentment in the South. And for those of you who are not familiar with the symbolism in these protests, if you want to find out who's running a protest, if you see that pink scarf, right, or you see pink handkerchiefs, you see pink signs, that's the Yemeni Socialist Party. They have taken the lead on that particular thing. They're not red, they're pink. They're not quite communist, they're just, they're a little more, you know. So what is that all about? Well, that resentment is centered around Aden, right, the port city in the south, uh, and Aden and Abyan provinces, right, um, which were the capital of the former People's Democratic Republic, remember People's Democratic Republic of Yemen. The whole thing started up again in 2007 when a group of military officers that were in the Yemeni military retired and then the Yemeni government denied them retirement pay. And these were guys that had been officers in the People's Democratic Republic of Yemen who had then gone into, the mil into military service for the Republic of Yemen after the Civil War. Right? But these guys were subsequently denied retirement pay and they said, hey look, you know, you're beating up on us, you're not giving us what we deserve because we were on the wrong side of the Civil War, but we served you, you should give us your retirement pay. And it underscored these, these fragmenta this fragmentation that has always existed in Yemeni society and sort of opened those cracks up again. Well, by 2008, that, those protests and the government's rather unpleasant way of putting down these protests, which involves basically circling around the protesters and shooting them, um, turns into pockets of armed resistance where people in the South say, hey, look, government, 
Yemeni security services, you're not from here, you're not of here, you're not us, we're going to fight you. Because these are all northerners that are coming down to the south to put down the southern rebellion. So by 2008, 2009, you see this resistance movement start to pick up. Now, interestingly enough, the resistance movement has tapered off in the last six to, to nine months because these folks are now mobilizing in Sana'a. Right? They've taken a nonviolent approach, by and large, in the country's capital, right? going after the regime through different mechanisms. But one of the things that's happened as a result of all of this is, as I mentioned earlier, you have this bizarre convergence between local tribal groups who have absolutely no interest in the Yemeni Socialist Party's ideology or its, or its remembered history of the glories of Soviet you know, satellitehood, signing up with these guys because they think it's all going to fall apart and they want to be sure that they're backing the right horse or that they can take advantage of the right horse when the time comes. So you saw in 2010, and we've seen in recent months as well, some of the local tribal groups in this region who used to previously be allied with the central government defecting from the central government and backing unofficially Southern Succession and or the Yemeni Socialist Party. Remember, coalitions of coalitions, wheels within wheels, it is Dune. And then you have what we hear about here in the West. You have Al-Qaeda cells. So we have a Houthi rebellion in the North. We have a Southern succession in the South. And now we have these guys. You have the Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Now these guys, the best way to describe them is they are radical opportunists. Right? They are taking advantage of the situation that already exists, be it political, be it demographic, be it economic, be it the breakdown in secular Arab nationalism as an organizing ideology, right? And so how are they doing that? Well, in 2009, you see the merger of these two cells, one, two Al-Qaeda cells, one operating in Saudi Arabia that was basically radicalizing people and then moving them into the Iraq theater. And then when that didn't work, they were radicalizing people and running operations against the Saudi security services. When the Saudis come down hard on these guys, these guys go over the border into the mountains in Yemen, right? They're using Yemen as a sanctuary. The Yemeni leaders, however, in this movement are by and large returning Al-Qaeda members, right? These are guys who have fought in Afghanistan. They have, you know, in one case, one of them was the personal secretary to bin Laden. They've seen that war up close. Some of these guys have been in Guantanamo Bay, have subsequently been repatriated, were put in a jail, and then in 2008 broke out of the jail. Why? Because the Saleh government has accommodated the sidelined Islamists in a bid to sort of keep everybody happy and center everything around its own system of doling out preferences and rents and authorities and things like that to sort of manage the disequilibrium in Yemeni society. So these guys are hardened, right? They've been in the global jihad. They get it, right? They've not just been in the global jihad. They've been to, Guant they've been to Kandahar, to Guantanamo, and then back to Yemen. So who do they target? These guys are targeting primarily the Yemeni security ser services, right? Mostly in Aden and Abiyan provinces. Um, they've done it very effectively. They literally go out and do individual assassinations where someone will rock up and shoot the guy at point blank range with the understanding that the shooter is going to get wiped out. It's a tactic we saw among Al Qaeda in Iraq people uh, in the central provinces north of Baghdad. They're also targeting foreigners. And they've targeted foreigners pretty consistently when they've had the opportunity, mostly tourists, mostly convoys, but also direct hits on the US embassy two times and the British embassy once, plus a hit on the, uh, an attempted hit, unsuccessful on the British ambassador not too long ago. But interestingly, they have minimal involvement, absolutely minimal involvement in this whole political drama that I just described to you a few minutes ago. Right? That's not their drama. That's not their game. These guys are out in the hinterlands of Al Sabwa province, maybe in Abiyan province. Right? They're not involved in what's going on in Aden, unless they're targeting Yemeni security officials there. And they're certainly not involved in what's going on in Sana'a. They also have no connection to what's happening with the Houthi rebellion in the north. Right? Al Qaeda, radical Salafi jihadis don't really like Shia Muslims very much. But do they? So AQAP is different from Al-Qaeda in some pretty important ways. And I'm presenting this part, as, although I've done the three different lens analysis, I'm presenting this little bit here on AQAP to give you sort of a net assessment of who they really are and what they're really about so that when you're talking to your students about Al-Qaeda in Yemen, you can 
help them develop a more critical and hopefully analytical perspective. First, their characteristics, right? These guys are not doing what Al-Qaeda usually does. What Al-Qaeda has historically done is gone to somebody else's conflict, shown up with their ideology, their money, and their fighters, and said, we are here to help you. All you have to do is be like us, and we will fight jihad against the infidels and apostates. And in some cases, like, I don't know, Afghanistan and the Taliban, they say, yeah, we could really use your money and your expertise. We don't know how to fly helicopters. Can you help us with helicopters? And by the way, we're really sick of the Tajiks. Can you go blow up Ahmad Shah Massoud? Right? So they'll do that. And in some cases, it works. In other cases, Al Qaeda has shown up in, in particular theaters like, oh, I don't know, Central and Western Iraq. And they've said, yes, we are here to help you. We're going to run your insurgency. You'll provide us with manpower. And no, we don't have any money, but we've got a lot of weapons. We've got all these foreign fighters coming in to help you, and they'll be happy to suicide themselves, but we're going to be marrying your daughters. And the whole thing breaks down. Right? Why? Because this stuff is fundamentally personal. It's fundamentally local. Right? The part of the reason why the United States was able to turn the local insurgency against al-Qaeda in Iraq was because these guys had fundamentally different interests. They had a fundamentally different perception of what they wanted out of the insurgency they were fighting. And at the end of the day, they could not stand each other because the tribal sheikhs don't want some dirtbag coming into their neighborhood and saying, I'm going to be marrying your daughter. Personality matters. Family connections matter. The local perspective is absolutely essential. If you take only a global view, only a regional view, you lose these things that allow us to take advantage of you know, discontinuities and conflicts and competition among our adversaries. So, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula has learned these, rule, learned these lessons. And rather than telling people what to do, they've showed up and integrated themselves very successfully into their own indigenous tribal networks. As a result, they benefit from home field advantage, right? That is something that no Al-Qaeda franchise or cell, the brief exception of the Saudi cell that was active between 2004 and 2008, none of these cells have actually enjoyed. Right? Even if you look at Al-Qaeda in Iraq, there are a lot of Iraqis who are affiliated with that movement, but those guys have absolutely no street cred with their own tribes because they went against the tribe. Right? Here, they're integrating back into their home tribes. Right? They're coming with water and help to build a mosque and help to build a school. Right? They're building irrigation ditches. Totally different approach. As I said, they've learned from Al-Qaeda's failures in Iraq. Right? One of those failures, interestingly enough, was Al-Qaeda in Iraq was really militant about targeting Shia. Right? Well, the Shia were running an insurgency against us. Remember Muqtada al-Sadr? Well, Al-Qaeda in Iraq would go out gunning for the Shia and use these massive attacks against Shia targets as a way of getting everybody riled up and making things less stable, right? making it harder and impossible for everyone to govern. In Yemen, Interestingly enough, again, for the first time ever, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula has tried to reach out to the, the, the Houthi rebels. Right? They've come up with all of these reasons why it's okay for them as a Salafi jihadi group to ally themselves with and have respect for. Now, the Houthis want nothing to do with them because they know what that's all about. Right? But they've changed their tone. Interestingly enough, they've changed their tone even about the Yemeni socialists. Remember, these are the people that bin Laden was obsessed about right, during the Yemeni civil war, 2000, sorry, 1994. Right, because he'd just come out of fighting these socialist Afghans and their Soviet supporters in Afghanistan. Right? So they're finding ways of building alliances rhetorically, right? not politically, rhetorically, with these other sources of instability within Yemen. Now, those other sources really want nothing to do with them, and they have no interest in aligning themselves with them, but you see a shift in their perspective. You see a shift in their approach. You see a shift in their method messaging said, willing to accommodate their ideological adversaries in order to take advantage of the situation. Most importantly, these guys, because they were Al-Qaeda, but they are local, have managed to integrate the ideological dictates of global jihad with the practical day-to-day -day realities of running a local insurgency. So what are their objectives? Well, their objectives can be described in basically two categories, near enemy and far enemy. And unlike other Al-Qaeda groups, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula is really interested in the near enemy, which is the Yemeni government, but not so much the Yemeni government, the Saudi government. So the near enemy perspective, they're looking to exploit the social and political turmoil in Yemen. 
right? They're not looking to harness it. They're not looking to cause it or create it. They don't see themselves taking power in Yemen. They want to take advantage of the situation on the ground. Why? To maintain an operational base in the Arab core. Remember I said earlier that the war on terror is shifting, right? The, the fundamental paradigm of the war on terror is shifting from global jihad on the periphery of Islamic culture and geography back to much more localized conflicts in the Arab core, right? In Egypt, in the Levant, in the Arabian Peninsula, especially the Arabian Peninsula. What are they also hoping to do? They're hoping to forge some kind of an alliance with al-Shabaab in Somalia. It's the militant uh, jihadi group in Somalia. Now, the problem there is that mm, Yemenis don't like Somalis very much. There's, I hate to say it, is, although Islam says there aren't supposed to be any distinctions between tribe and race and creed, they got it, right? They, they have this image of Africans that's not necessarily a positive one. Um, the other issue is that al-Shabaab is a net, a net uh, consumer of resources rather than a contributor. Right, Al-Shabaab will say how they're going to they, you know, stand in solidarity with their brothers in Yemen and all the rest. And then they'll say, but by the way, could you please send us some money and some fighters? We're having a hard time down here in Mogadishu. Right? In fact, the whole reason Al-Shabaab radicalized the way it did was in the hope that foreign fighters would come in and help them augment their local jihad. Right? And then what else are they after? Their ultimate goal is to topple the Saudi regime and install a pure theocracy with the goal of purifying the Arabian Peninsula and using the core of Islam, the historical birthplace of Islam, as a basis for reestablishing the caliphate. So they still have this global ideology, but it's tied to a local insurgent agenda. So we have al -Awaki. You know, What is the far enemy component of their strategy? Well, the far enemy component involves reestablishing al-Qaeda's propaganda operations to sort of keep the movement alive, despite the fact that the senior leadership's been so badly abused and decimated in the Afghanistan-Pakistan theater. Their goal has, primarily has been to incite Western Muslims, English-speaking Muslims especially, to violence against targets in Britain and the United States. We see this with Major Hassan. We've also seen it with uh, Faisal Sazad and the um, uh, Times Square bombing, or attempted Times Square bombing. Why do they want to do that? Why are they doing this and sending Nigerian Muslims on planes over Detroit? With the goal of provoking a U.S. military intervention in Yemen. Right? Why did bin Laden hit us uh, you know, on September 11th? With the goal, the explicit goal, the stated written goal of drawing us into Afghanistan. Why do they do that? Because in their world, a massive conflict between East and West, between Islam and Christianity, will encourage other Muslims to come to them, will help them mobilize the complacent Muslim masses, allow them to topple the Saudi regime and install a purified theocracy and use that purified theocracy as the basis for restoring the global caliphate. Same ideology, same general perspective, same sort of provocation-based strategy. Right? The terror is provocation-based rather than intimidation-based but it's read through a fundamentally local lens rather than a global lens. So what are the policy implications in sum? If we're looking at these three lenses, demographic, political, and strategic, the demographic lens tells us about the problems that ordinary Yemenis face today and must solve tomorrow. The political lens tells us about the internal divisions and disputes that are currently defining governance or the lack of governance or as I like to call it, the dysfunctional equilibrium in Yemen today. And the security dimension, the security lens, tells us about the sources of Yemen's internal stability and our own potential risks arriving from that, arising from that instability. So three lessons to leave you with. In the demographic sphere, the crisis in Yemen is grounded in the precipitous collapse of their economic, ecological, and social structures. In the political sphere, the crisis in Yemen underscores this tension, and it's a long-standing historical tension in Yemeni society between attempts to centralize the state and a fundamentally decentralized society. It's based around tribal networks and other forms of legitimacy that have nothing to do with state formation, have nothing to do with parliaments or bureaucracies or democracy or anything like that. And in the security domain, the lesson here is that the crisis in Yemen is more about indigenous dynamics than it is about the global war on terrorism. So what are the lessons for students? Generally, from a pedagogical perspective, here's your takeaway. Local conditions matter more than regional trends or our perceptions of regional trends. Different events have different causes. Right? They're not all linked together. In fact, coincidence of events is neither correlation 
nor causation. Right? This is like, you want to understand the difference between teaching someone to be a citizen and teaching someone to be an employee, right? That distinction right there is crucial, absolutely crucial to making a representative constitutional democracy like ours work. If there's no other lesson you can teach your students, that's the one that's the most important lesson to teach from history, especially with contemporary history in the Middle East. And finally, focusing exclusively on terrorism and the war on terrorism gives us a limited, very limited insight into the causes and consequences of the crisis. Now, what are the lessons for policymakers? I would argue that local instability fosters regional insecurity. Well, we knew that. But our diplomacy has to engage the society in Yemen, not just the political elites. We're very, very good at the state to state stuff. Why? Because we have a functioning state. We assume that other people want one as well. But in Yemen, that's not necessarily the case. Power resides at the local level. 73% of the population is rural. 50% of the population is illiterate, right? The people we are talking to in Yemen today are the political elites or the political elite in opposition. We're not talking to the society on the ground, and there's no wonder that Al-Qaeda is able to infiltrate and do things like build mosques and irrigation ditches and schools. They're from there, they understand that. We're not operating in that sphere. If we want to beat them at that game, we need to be in that sphere and not focusing on what's happening in Sana'a. Final, AQAP is opportunistic. Right? It's taking advantage of what's happening in Yemen, but it is not the dominant force in Yemen. It's not even the dominant story. It may be the dominant story for us, but not for them. And finally, focusing exclusively, and Jillian mentioned this earlier, focusing exclusively on our near-term security risks, our near-term security imperatives is undermining our long-term interests, not just in the Middle East, not, sorry, not just in Yemen, but in the Middle East writ large. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to critical discourse, critical thinking, and a spirited discussion. Thank you. Um, Mr. Swift, hi. I don't know if you're ready. I didn't. Questions go, good? Go ahead. Okay. Please okay. introduce well, yourself. Well, you jump in and, you know, <laughs> Please introduce yourself. Sort of, take a break. Uh, my name is John Larkins. I'm in Richmond, Virginia. Um, my question is sort of a, uh, two, two, a couple of smaller questions, I guess, instead of one big one. Uh, my first one is that the situation you describe in some ways seem, seems a little like uh, Afghanistan in terms of it, 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 the, is is a decentralized government necessary uh, if we try to, you know, any attempt at imposing a cent strong central state, is it doomed to failure? Uh, so that leads to the question of, you know, should we go back, is there a two-state solution, uh, a return to a two-state solution, you know, a go should be a goal in, in Yemen maybe. The other one is, what is Saudi Arabia and the other Arab power brokers nearby with money, the Gulf states, sort of where are they uh, with this conflict? Sure. Let me attack each of your questions in turn. And let me start with the presumption that we can analogize one conflict and one country to another. There are some, one of the problems we have in our entire conception of American foreign policy and our security interests and our economic interests and our political interests around the world is this obsession with analogical reasoning, right? Analogical reasoning is like counterfactual history. It's, a taut it's tautologically fallacious. Fallacious, fallacious, you can't, it doesn't tell you what's actually happening. It tells you what you think might be happening based on your own preconceptions drawn from what happened at another place where you might have had your own preconceptions, right? So don't think about analogies unless you're also willing to do the distinguishing. In the law they teach you when you're arguing a case to analogize the things that are the same and distinguish the things that are different. And if we're analogizing without distinguishing, we're creating connections and causations and correlations that may not actually exist on the ground. So that's, that's the first sort of a pedagogical rejoinder to the, the, the question. Now the second question, a two-state solution or a centralized state, look, the centralized, the structured centralized state in Yemen isn't working. It never existed. It's not going to exist at any point in the near future. To the extent that it has existed, it's existed because the regime has been able to control the security apparatus and the oil revenues, and has used those instruments to, as a carrot and a carrot and stick of approach to keep itself going. They've only been able to manage that for 32 years. It's all coming apart now. That's not a sustainable basis on which to build a society, and it's not the way to deal with the legitimate aspirations, economic, political, cultural, of the majority of the Yemeni population. 
the, the trick in Yemen is not to fix the state or have a two-state solution. The trick in Yemen is to find an equilibrium between the regions and the localities and the center. It's to take that dysfunctional equilibrium and turn it into a functional equilibrium. I don't know how to do that because I'm not a Yemeni. Right? I've studied Afghanistan. Afghanistan has a lot of the very same things. There was no state in Afghanistan. Kingdom, yes, right? but no state, no fiscal military apparatus, anything like, I mean, to the extent that these, these countries are states, they are what one former professor of mine calls fragile facsimiles of the Westphalian state. Right? So they have to take their own path to political integration and to stability and, and to a functional equilibrium. So I would focus more on the equilibrium, right? an equilibrium that is starting to address some of the demographic and economic issues and sideline some of the opportunists, then I would focus on state structures. Now, as for who's been involved in Yemen and what they've been doing, it depends on who they are. The United States has been involved with, in Yemen with drones. The United Kingdom has been involved with Yemen by taking their SAS and going and training their counterterrorism people. They're very good at it. Uh, the French have been involved in Yemen by showing up and doing some very interesting diplomacy. The Germans have been in Yemen with a lot of money, mostly focused on development aid. But again, that is focused primarily in, in urban rural regions, and the people that they're reaching out to tend to be other professors, right? The other professors may be 15% of the people protesting in Yemen. They are 95% of the people who are appearing on the front pages of the New York Times and the Washington Post, or even in Al Jazeera, right? That's not the majority of the Yemeni population. Nobody's talking to that 73%, 50% illiterate. Right? That's, so the Germans are, are in there doing mostly development, and they're doing it by and through the European Union, and they're doing all right. The Saudis, by and through the Gulf Coordination Council, have been involved on two fronts. The first is pouring a ton of money into the Saudi regime, and it, what I think is a failed effort to prop it, up, prop it up, while at the same time undermining the Saudi regime by saying the Saudi regime needs to go and a new government needs to be brought in. Why are they doing that? Because they, the Saudi, Saudi Arabia especially, but the other Gulf countries, Oman and the UAE and the others in the region face the same dilemma we do, which is balancing our short-term security imperatives, our perception of a fundamental existential crisis caused by Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, all 250 of them, right? You could stick them in a ballroom here, probably, with our long-term economic, political, cultural, and social interests, right? This is not a new, this is not a new issue, right? Balancing the urgent and the important is what policymakers are paid to do, right? The problem is the urgent is gonna kill you and it's gonna kill you right now and it's gonna get you unelected in the next election. In our system or in their system, it's gonna mean that you get retired to the fall. In Saudi Arabia, you get retired to the, to the desert. Um, the, important is what, the important is what kind of conversation are my children's children gonna be having about Yemen and the greater Middle East, right? The important is what kind of problems are your students going to be solving in the Middle East. Don't think for a second that your students are just you know, all passing through. Some of them might do things like go out and get a law degree, get a PhD, go to some of these places and try to fix what's going wrong. Right? So balancing that distinction between the urgent and the important is not just something that we deal with, not just something with it, that Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia deals with. It's something that's really fundamental to the kind of critical thinking that you need to be encouraging students to be doing in your classrooms. I hope that's a fair answer. Uh, in terms of the student would you, focus. Would you, would you please introduce yourself? Yes, Jason O'Connor at North Broward Preparatory School. Thank you. In terms of the student focus, um, I thought your um, PowerPoint is very powerful. Why should uh, Yemen be a country that should be concerned about? With, uh, with everything you just emphasized in terms of their poor quality, or basically poor economics, demographic issue, what security concern or impact do they have in the region as a whole? There are three different answer, ways to answer that question. The first is uh, pedagogical, uh, what you can learn about learning from studying Yemen. Uh, and I've tried to integrate some of that into my presentation. Um, the second is uh, current history. And the third goes to the broader question of you know, how our civilization interacts with other civilizations, how our society perceives and responds to and, and approaches other other societies. So from a pedagogical perspective, right, I think the point I've tried to make here is if you look at Yemen through a war on terror lens exclusively, 
you have a very narrow, very, very narrow perception of what's happening in the country and what your interests are in that country. One of the, uh, you know, one of the complaints I have about the current U.S. foreign policy in Yemen is that the decisions are being made by former CIA operators, right? They're being made at the tactical level. They're not being made at the strategic level. Now, that doesn't mean we don't use force. It doesn't mean we don't target the bad guys and, and take them out of circulation. What it means is we've got to have something more than right now in our thinking and planning, right? So that pedagogical question, right, brings us into the question of how do people make decisions? How should leaders make the right kind of decisions? How do they balance the now with the later, right? At what point are the decisions they're making to take care of a problem now mortgaging the future? And that takes us to the third piece, right, how we perceive respond to and interact with other cultures. Look, I grew up in northern New Hampshire, right? I, when I went to Dartmouth, I thought, oh my god, a city that has 10,000 people in it and 4,000 of them are students, how am I ever going to find my way around this place? <laughs> right? The world that my parents grew up in and the world that my grandparents grew up in, it couldn't be any more different from the world that your students and my children are going to grow up in. Right? If they don't have that ability to step out of their own shoes and stand in somebody else's shoes in a different culture and see that person's problems from their perspective, there's no way they're going to be able to work with them to solve those problems. If there's a fundamental flaw in American diplomacy, not American strategy, in American diplomacy, it's that the majority of the people we are training to be diplomats and represent us overseas think that there's this static think that the cultures that we're approaching, the societies we're approaching are static, right? Or think that they're somehow, you know, set by microeconomic theory that they learned in an international relations class when they were an undergraduate. These things are fluid, they are dynamic, right? We are the decisions we make. That's what history teaches us. History teaches us that we are the decisions we make. And when we can stand in somebody else's shoes, even if we fundamentally disagree with them, if we can stand in somebody else's shoes, we can see something through their lens rather than ours, it enriches our perspective, it improves our policy, and it humanizes our adversaries in a way to make it easier for us to collaborate and communicate rather than fight. Next question. Final question. Uh, Dave Barrett from Memphis, Tennessee. Um, first of all, my compliments on uh, putting on someone else's glasses to understand the situation in their own country. That's something we, we don't do a lot. But secondly, with your background in law and then also your understanding of this region, uh, with the drone strikes that are going on, uh, and you may not feel comfortable commenting on that, but uh, do you feel that the United States has the, the legal say to to conduct those in a country where we have not officially declared war, where, where there's still some questions of things, and are we perhaps just doing more damage or creating more uh, uh, potential enemies down the road by doing such actions? I'm going to answer that question from two different perspectives. Right? The first perspective is going to be as an international lawyer who can tell you what the law is or what I understand the law to be, and the second is going to be as the PhD who studied war and its secondary and tertiary effects. From a legal perspective, the administration has articulated two grounds for going after Alawaki. One of them is legal, one of them is right, and one of them is fundamentally wrong. The one that's fundamentally wrong is the imminence, the imminent threat uh, argument. Uh, and the argument that they're articulating there is that we can deprive Alawaki of his life without due process of law, i.e. violate his Fifth Amendment rights, because he poses an imminent threat. Well, the problem with that is the jurisprudence of imminence requires that the perpetrator pull out a gun and be shooting at you, and the shoot, police are shooting back at him, right? What Alawaki has done, and he's done some really nasty things, is incite violence, plan violence, advise on violence, but then there's this gap in time and space, right? And that gap in time and space means it's not imminent. And by the way, it's the same rule that we use in international law when, uh, with the whole co concept of what's called pre uh, preventive self-defense, uh, sorry, preemptive self-defense. If the Germans are massing at the Polish border, right, and the engines are primed and the tanks are loaded and they're ready to go, 
Polish can bomb those tanks, right? That's preemptive self-defense because the threat is imminent. But the Germans are riding around in circles, you know, and they're just making a whole lot of noise, and you know, they maybe go over it and get another beer at the beer garden. That's not, and but you're worried, but they're doing it in tanks, and you really don't like that. That's not imminent, right? It's separated in time and space. It has to be right now. They have to be shooting at you or about to pull the trigger. So the imminence argument that the administration is using under international law, under U.S. law, and by the way, under our common law conception of self-defense, right? You can shoot at some, you can use violence in self-defense if the threat is imminent. But if the guy goes around the quarter and goes into the pub to have a Guinness, you can't hunt him down and then beat him up, right? You can only use force in that instant when the moment is instantaneous, you have no other choice. So the other grounds that's been used, and I think these are the appropriate grounds, is that you have an individual who was you know, planning and acting out armed attacks against the United States. That individual understood himself to be part of a war against the United States. And that individual was operating in a foreign theater. Right? If we picked up al Hawaki in the United States, he would have had to go to trial. Fifth Amendment would override. Right? Because the Fifth Amendment over, and in, inside US territory overrides the president's Article 2.2 authorities. If it didn't, we'd all live in a very different society. We'd look like something, live in a society that looks a lot like what Iran is turning into. Um, outside the United States, the law of war, right, it, what they call, ironically, international humanitarian law is what governs. And what we did against al awaki is legal, as much as people may not like it, is legal under international humanitarian law. Even in the absence of a congressional authorization, and I would be the first to argue that the congressional authorization from after 9-11 and 2001 is so far removed from what we're doing in Yemen today. Even if that, but even if you didn't have that there, you know, under Youngstown and its progeny and the, the Supreme Court precedent that's associated there, there's still gonna, as long as Congress is by and large on the president's side, no court is gonna step in and say that what he was doing was counter to U.S. law or counter international law. It's not going to happen. Um, the other thing that makes what happened in Yemen different from what we did to, say, Osama bin Laden in Pakistan is that we did it with the permission and knowledge of the Yemeni government. Changes the situation entirely because we're not violating their sovereignty, right? We are doing something that they know about that they have approved. That makes it even more legal. So that's the legal side of it, the uncomfortable legal side of it. Now, the, the secondary and tertiary effects get me back to, of drone strikes generally, get me back to the whole question of you know, whether this is the right policy. I would argue that the drones are a preferable means of engaging these kinds of adversaries, primarily because they limit the possibility of um, collateral damage, they limit the possibility of hurting civilians. Um, they tend to be very targeted, they require a high amount of diligence before you can run the operation. So it is preferable to all of the other instruments we might use at a distance. It might even be preferable to counterinsurgency operations. The problem is fighting a war by remote control distorts, from a, from a human perspective, distorts our perception of what war is about, what war is about. Right? Well, law is about creating order and resolving disputes. War is about grinding your adversary into the ground until he says uncle. Right? And then using his, his weaker position to create favorable terms of peace. If you're Nazi Germany, that means exterminating all the Jews, enslaving the Soviets, and just generally creating mayhem. If you're the United States, it involves setting up the IMF, the World Bank, and trying to do something positive in the world. Right? But that's what war is. It's instrumental. It's fundamentally instrumental. The problem is if we don't align our near-term tactics with our long-term interests, a process called strategy, we will always be in a position where we are reacting to a crisis that we've created or that we've exacerbated. So in the near term, what we did was legal, but in the long term, we have got to come up with other mechanisms and put those mechanisms to play. Otherwise, we're not gonna be able to control for war secondary and tertiary effects, right? War, as Clausewitz said, is, <laughs> is something that left unchecked will consume everything and everyone and fundamentally transform the nature of the people and the societies that are engaged in that war. So we should use it in a limited fashion. We should only use it in extremis. And we've got to develop other mechanisms that complement our use of drones and our use of targeted strikes. I hope that's a fair answer. Thank you very much, Christopher.